Okay, students. All right. So uh, this will be lecture six, I believe. <clears throat> and today we're going to start uh, getting into more detailed aspects of the uh, of metamaterials, or at least the electromagnetic treatment of now the metamolecules, the structures that uh, will be replacing our naturally occurring uh, materials or, or atoms and molecules within the material. Because we found that it's not possible with naturally occurring materials to induce the electromagnetic behavior necessary to get epsilon and mu both being negative at the same time. So we have to figure out more clever ways to do that using man-made structures. And so um, this chapter in uh, Marquez's book, uh, we're going to split it up at least into two, probably uh, a few more lectures. The first of which we will talk about how to achieve a negative epsilon. Uh, that in itself is not very unique, but being able to uh, get a negative epsilon in such a way that you can later on put in structures that provide a negative mu. Uh, and so then once we have that, we would have both negative epsilon and negative mu. So today we're going to be looking at what's called Fakir's bed, uh, or more commonly referred to as a wire mesh grid. And that's going to mimic the behavior of a metal in the visible spectral regime, uh, which themselves have um, a negative epsilon, but a positive mu. All right, so we're only going to go halfway with the mesh wire grid, but it's going to um, open the door to go the rest of the way. So, so this chapter uh, is called the synthesis of bulk metamaterials, but that is not really the best title for the chapter because it's not only the synthesis of it, um, but the the theory behind it as well. Um, so, so that's that's what we actually want. So in this class, we are learning mostly about the traditional bulk metamaterials. Uh, this means that we consider materials that appear to be homogeneous, namely uniform, um, from the perspective of incident light. The optical properties uh, can be described by only a few parameters, such as epsilon and mu. Okay, so what this means is that this goes back to the traditional definition of metamaterials, where they say, um, the researchers, the pioneers in this field said, uh, this is going to be starkly very different, and very different from the other classes of light controlling materials, such as photonic crystals, plasmonic crystals, combinations of those, frequency selective surfaces, things like that. Uh, in that, in those structures I just mentioned, photonic crystals, plasmonic crystals, the optical properties um, are more due to um, the shape and the sizes of the geometries within the material. Dielectric resonators, gratings, um, metallic ridges, those sorts of things. And you get resonance resonances from from um, within the resonators uh, due to the fact that they're land over two or land over four in size, uh, size relative to the wavelength of the incident light. And so it's not to do uh, so these feature sizes are up on the order of the wavelength of light. And so from the perspective of light, that photonic crystals are certainly not homogeneous materials that can be described by a few parameters, epsilon and mu. The optical properties are very complex. And so in the traditional metamaterial field, they say those are excluded uh, from using the term metamaterials. All right. And uh, we want to have uh, reserve that term for materials whose optical properties can be described by only a few parameters, such as epsilon and mu, and epsilon is not position de dependent, so you, it doesn't change when you go from position to position within your material. It's homogeneous and uniform. So like I said, uh, this restriction eliminates photonic crystals that has many features with sizes on the order of the wavelength of light at which it operates. So 
uh, for the material to be homogeneous, um, the rule of thumb, it's not hard and fast, but the general rule is that the features should be somewhere around lambda over 10 in size. All right. So if the feature sizes are uh, less than lambda over 10, where lambda is the frequency at which this material is supposed to operate, then uh, the material will look to be homogeneous, uni uniform, from the perspective of light. And, uh, and therefore, we will assign it different uh, particular uniform values for epsilon and mu, or position independent values for epsilon and mu. Um, okay, so obtaining a negative epsilon. So how can you obtain a negative epsilon is the question. Well, the easy answer is, well, you would just say, well, just use a highly conductive metal in the visible spectral regime. Everyone knows that that has a highly negative real part to the ep to epsilon. All right. Um, but then you'll immediately know that the problem with that approach is that we need both epsilon and mu to be negative. And the metal, while it does have a negative epsilon, it has a, um, it has a positive uh, mu. So a metal by itself, of course, is not a metal material. We knew that uh, before. However, we can take a look at the metals and get some inspiration about how to fix up this positive mu value, making it a negative value. But uh, we have to take a few steps first. So a bulk metal only has epsilon as negative. So how do we fix this? Answer. Uh, well, we do not fill up all space with the metal. Just use a wire mesh. So we'll work up to why this answer, why this is an answer to this problem. Um, so if we don't use up all the space, then there's space available for us to put in features that imbue the material with a negative mu. So Marquez's approach, uh, Marquez's, Marquez approaches this solution in baby steps by first considering metallic waveguides, then a, pure, a single metallic waveguide, then a periodic array of waveguides, and then the full D of a full 3D wire mesh grid. Okay. So um, let's first do the single uh, metal waveguide. It is interesting to compare the electromagnetic properties of a waveguide to a metal, as he does in the book. Um, the propagation constant of the fundamental TE10 mode is given by this, where uh, omega c is the cutoff frequency, and it depends on uh, the width of the waveguide A. All right. And so, but now this is very, this epsilon times the quantity 1 minus omega c squared over omega squared is highly suggestive because it is very similar to the Druda model of the dielectric uh, constant of a metal where omega c uh, is act is in a metal omega p, the, the plasma frequency. So let's go back to here. So if you compare this to the corresponding value in a metal, you will have the same functional dependence if you identify omega c with omega p, namely the metal's plasma frequency. And then having that the effective dielectric constant or permittivity is, epsilon, is this, epsilon naught times the quantity 1 minus omega c squared over omega squared. And then we also, uh, you have the same thing for the, uh, for the wave impedance, that Z is equal to omega mu naught over uh, the wave number, wave vector K, wave number. And so this equivalence uh, is quite strong. Um, so the waveguide, from the perspective of this TE10 mode, uh, kind of mimics the behavior of a metal, all right? So now we just, uh, so going from one waveguide to filling of all space with waveguides, we can make then a 2D array of these waveguides, as illustrated in the book, and I try to illustrate it here as well, but my scanner uh, doesn't really work all that well. Um, uh, and so, so then we just fill up all space with these waveguides oriented along one axis.
And so the material then will behave as a metal in that direction, for incident light in that direction that excites the TE10 modes, um, while leaving space available within the material for you to put in additional structural elements that very well may imbue the structure with the negative mu as well. Okay. So, you will show in a homework problem uh, that the average component of the magnetic field of the TE10 mode in the direction of the propagation, uh, in the direction of propagation vanishes, making this into a TEM mode, and then with the with an average electric polarization as given below. So this is a homework problem in the O2. I'll be assigning it, where um, E in diagonal brackets is oriented parallel to the plates, and uh, H in diagonal brackets is oriented perpendicular with respect to the place. So you will work this, but the important thing here is the negative. All right. Um, so the polarization vector is in the opposite direction of the, uh, the electric field. So, so why are media? So now we can take this concept uh, to its penultimate conclusion, next to the last step, the 3D wire mesh grid. This cubic mesh of wires, so now we basically get rid of the walls of the array of waveguides, and instead only put in a wire grid. So we're basically taking more uh, a lot of the metal away. Does this affect the optical performance? Um, yeah, in some ways, but it keeps the important aspect of negative epsilon uh, for a wide frequency range. So this cubic mesh of wires will act similarly to the plate array, but it is isotropic in its response to incident light. So light can come in from all different angles, and uh, the grid will um, have the same optical properties. That's what isotropic means. One may expect to be able to express omega p as c pi over a, as it was in the waveguide system. However, this is one of the big things that's affected. Omega p is not quite as simple as c pi over a. Uh, so we need to take a fresh look at this, a more careful look at this. So to do this, let's just look at a 1D grid of wires. All right. So just like in the book, uh, of course, this comes out of the book, that we're going to put PEC on the top and the bottom, PMCs on the, on the uh, left and right portion, and we're going to have a repeat, uh, we're going to have a grid of wires that goes along the x-axis. All right. So with this, um, we then have a, uh, with the PEC on the top and bottom, we have a transmission uh, line that can be um, assessed as a, a model as this with um, series inductances, LS, and uh, series capacitance, CS. So those are per unit length inductances and capacitances. And then we have shunt inductances produced by the wires. All right, so this is by the wires uh, going from um, this, uh, the transmission line to the ground. And that is um, estimated uh, to be mu naught a over 2 pi log a over r. All right, so um, in this, Pindry did this in uh, reference. I think reference two, which I uploaded on Moodle for you to see this in greater detail, the derivation of this right here. All right, um, and I'm going to assign a homework problem on that because that that this kind of lead, this leads to an equation for epsilon, uh, but it, but then other works do it uh, do a more uh, accurate derivation, and it, turn, it turns out where the more accurate derivation it is indeed quite a bit more accurate. Uh, than this fairly crude approximation. All right. Uh, but we'll go with this for the moment. All right. Once you have L and C, you can use standard transmission line theory to equate that to um, K squared. 
So then k squared is equal to omega squared. My scanning the scanner is not elected. That's not u. That's omega squared over a squared. L total c total. And L total uh, is going to be the combination of the series uh, inductance, I mean the per unit length inductance of the transmission line, plus L coming from the wires, and C total is just simply CS. All right, And so that combination leads to this, and you substitute N, and you get this equation right here. And then you'll notice you have the uh, epsilon naught, uh, you have the omega squared, and then you have this whole thing up here, around there, which should be your omega p squared. If we're trying to associate this in the same functional uh, form as a metal, you would then associate all of this with the omega p squared, which is exactly what Pendry did, I believe, in reference to. Again, that's uploaded on Moodle. Okay. So, that's interesting. So, Pendry got this, threw it out there. People use it all the time now for the wire mesh grid. All right? And so we find that uh, the, it's negative uh, for, um, he, here in front. And so then uh, you can ex uh, then you can express epsilon Just like this again. Okay, and so then you can have a negative epsilon if omega c is greater than omega. Uh, omega. All right, so for um, very small om omegas, um, you will have a negative epsilon, and you'll have, and so that's what we're shooting for. So, okay, but if you read through chapter uh, reference two, they do make a lot of assumptions. If you don't do that, you actually get omega p squared is equal to this, where you have a 2 pi up here, which is the same. You have the mu naught epsilon not up on the bottom. That's the same. Is this pi? Yeah, this. Uh, you have the a squared. That's the same. But here, you have something quite different. You have the log a over r, but here you have log a over 2 pi r. And then you have this, this correction term right here, plus 0 0.5275. So it's interesting to map, uh, to graph both of these out um, as a function of, of uh, a, for example, or the ratio a over r. But, um, and c how much they diverge. And it turns out where, where it's actually, um, they're quite a bit different. So we're going to be doing that as a homework problem where you can see that, um, that the original Pendry equation quite often doesn't produce very accurate results. Um, so, so this is actually a large correction and like I said we will investigate it more um, uh, in a homework problem. So, depending, you're going to use one formula or, or the other uh, for the omega p, but you're going to get some value. And then you can express epsilon in this way. Uh, for a polarization of incident light that can induce current in the wire. All right? So, if, it, if a, a certain polarization of light can't induce current in the wire, then that light doesn't really see um, the wire. And so the epsilon is just going to be equal to the free space epsilon or epsilon naught. So, um, so then you ask yourself, um, what polarization of light uh, could induce a current? Well, it's any polarization that has any component of E along the electric field along the wire. So this would be any light with a non-zero Kx or KY component. All right, so let, let's go back up to the wire mesh grid. So, um, so we need a electric E sub Z component that's not a zero. All right, 
And so for that, uh, we need light that, uh, that ha has some component go uh, of kx, some non-zero component of kx or ky or both. But at a minimum, it, it needs to have one be non-zero, kx or ky. And then that would mean that it's not fully propagating 100% down the z-axis because that's the polarization of light that will not induce a current. I mean, light coming straight down or straight up uh, will not have any component of the electric field um, parallel to the axis of the wire uh, and you don't get a current. So, and so you need the incident light to have a kx or a ky non-zero component. If the wave only has a kz component, the wave will not see, quote unquote, the metal grid. And epsilon will, for the, that incident light, will have an effective epsilon of epsilon naught. Okay, so with that, you may be then tempted to express epsilon as a tensor. With tensor components of Ex is equal to Ey is equal to epsilon naught. And Ez is what we had derived before is epsilon naught times a quantity, 1 minus omega p squared over omega squared. All right. But care must be taken when doing this, because this isn't right, as it turns out. But it's almost right. Um, we'll find that uh, all we need is a slightly different expression for E sub Z. All right? So we take a look at this in a little bit greater detail. So we're primarily interested in uh, the TM2Z EM waves. So transverse magnetic, uh, and it's uh, the magnetic field is transverse to the Z axis. Therefore, the magnetic field is oriented in some direction in the XY plane. So, um, that would then mean we have some component of the electric field in the z direction inducing current in the wires and uh, having a epsilon that's different than epsilon naught. We can solve so from your uh, advanced electromagnetics uh, course you know that uh, if we specify uh, the boundary conditions and the fact that we're doing T, M to Z, E, M waves, we can solve for all the E, M field components once we solve for E, Z. And E, Z satisfies this equation here, uh, again, from advanced electromagnetics, where your gamma squared is equal to K naught squared, omega squared over C squared, minus K, Z squared where k naught is omega squared over c squared, which is epsilon, uh, omega squared epsilon naught mu naught. And kz is the component of the wave vector along the wire's axis. Thus, e sub z will depend on both kz and omega, not just one, but the combination of both k sub z and omega. Fine. The dispersion relation for these Tm to Z modes with Kz is not equal to zero it is known in, in, um, in electromagnetics uh, to be equal to, to this. It's K squared uh, is equal to Kx squared plus Ky squared plus Kz squared is equal to K naught squared minus Kp squared where that's equal to the omega P squared uh, over C squared. All right so um, the dispersion relation for uh, waves in this structure, for TM to Z waves modes in this structure, is given by this. All right. Um, but for any material of this sort uh, that is hyperbolic, meaning it has different values for epsilon xx, epsilon yy, epsilon zz, it has to obey this equation as well. So we need this to be satisfied and this to be satisfied, all right? Where epsilon now is a tensor with uh, these two components being the same, epsilon xx is equal to epsilon yy. And so we express uh, the tensor like this, as you would expect. But now we have to see what con conditions 
that these two equations impose. So um, it's easy to work through maybe in a homework problem as well. Maybe, yeah, I guess I will do this for a homework problem. That those two equations cause um, cause your epsilon zz to be of this form, which looks largely similar, but you'll immediately recognize that we have this minus, this right here, kz squared in the denominator. So that's ex extremely important, all right? With uh, before, we had not had this at all in, in there. We just had the k naught squared, all right? And then you would have the uh, 1 over c squared uh, within here. That would cancel the 1 over c squared up top, and you would have the omega p squared over omega squared, which is what you had um, right here, all right? But uh, you don't. It turns out where epsilon depends on k sub z. Epsilon depends on k sub z like this. All right. Um, so, so uh, this is now the more accurate epsilon value um, for what is called a hyperbolic metamaterial. All right. Uh, it has a negative uh, epsilon, but it still has a positive mu. Remember. So we've only gone halfway. But um, what we will now what Pendry and Smith did is they um, they uh, use the available space within this structure to put in split ring resonators or uh, open ring resonators uh, that would provide the negative mu. So you get the negative epsilon from the wires, and you would get the negative mu from the uh, from the split ring resonator structures. And that is what we will uh, discuss uh, in the next lecture. So, uh, but the, this structure is extremely important. Um, and it's still used in a lot of different metamaterials, and we'll cover more of the applications of this later. Um, we ourselves are using it to do some really uh, interesting things with um, uh, light filtering uh, projects. And, uh, and so forth. So, Okay, the Fikir is bed or wire mesh allowing you to create a negative epsilon uh, without using uh, all the material, all the space within the material. That space that you free up uh, can be used uh, to house uh, structures that imbue the structure with a negative mu as well. Um, great, and that's the lecture for the day. And a homework will be forthcoming. Take care.